the IDOR project brought together a group of people who had not worked together before. They included geophysicists, geochemists, and people who were interested in field geology. And we're studying a boundary that occurred on the edge of North America that occurs right in that area on the border between Idaho and Oregon. What we're really trying to do is figure out what the story is of the Earth in this part of the world. We know that about 500 million years ago, Western Idaho was beachfront property. Oregon and Washington did not exist in their present form where they are. What has happened since then, about 200 million years ago, is that terrains from the Pacific Basin have collided with North America in a process we call assembly or accretion. They basically mashed themselves onto the western margin. And in Idaho, we have this boundary very clearly exposed, the boundary between what's old North America and then what are these younger and accreted terrains. So there's two reasons we're looking at this area. The first is to figure out how this boundary has controlled the subsequent deformation and magmatism. And the other reason we're looking for it is to see how the boundary has been modified through time. IDOR is an example of interdisciplinary science. Interdisciplinary science is well understood in terms of a story from India. It's about blind men and an elephant. And each of the blind men has a part of the elephant and is quite sure about what they're looking at. But none of them individually can understand what the elephant is. It's only by working together that they can understand the whole elephant. And that's the same thing that we're doing with the IDOR project. We have geochemists, geophysicists, and field geologists all working together to understand that area of the world. In the IDOR project, each of the methodologies has a different way that they either need to put out instruments or they need to sample the rock. Ray Russo and his team from the University of Florida use broadband seismometers to understand the deep structure of the mantle below this area. He needs to put out his passive seismometers about 35 kilometers from each other. And they put them in a grid on the landscape so that they covered a very large area. Now, every one of those stations was put in by a team of three people or two people over the course of a summer. So we had uh, quite a bit of work to dig holes, to put up solar panels, to build fences, to start these machines going, to keep them going over the period of two years while we recorded thousands of earthquakes, literally thousands of earthquakes, both from the area and also from everywhere in the world. Now we're in the process of analyzing this enormous amount of data, it amounts to almost 700 gigabytes of data that accrued during that two-year period. Our goal really is to relate today's structure to the past processes that have produced that structure. And often that's not a very straightforward thing to do, and particularly when you're talking about tens of millions of years of Earth history. So in that particular area, for example, there was a long history of subduction, it's a long history of lots of tectonic processes, volcanism, magmatism, rifting. Many different things have happened over the last hundred million years, but they leave behind a fingerprint. They leave behind an, a mark down in the earth. And our goal is to identify those marks and to interpret them correctly so that we can put together a comprehensive picture from surface down to depth of exactly what's happened in this particular preserved, unusually preserved, part of the plate boundary. John Hole uses a different kind of seismometer. He uses short period instruments, which means they record very quickly, and he puts a whole lot of them out, over 2,000, and what he does is he creates his own earthquakes by blowing up a lot of explosions, and he knows exactly when he blows them up, so he knows how long it takes for the seismic waves to travel to the different sites along that same line. So the University of Florida's data set using those large distant earthquakes allows them to see very deep underneath the ground under the IDOR transect. They can see at a very large scale from many miles to hundreds of miles down in the subsurface. But in order to see the shallower structure at a better detail, we are setting off these shallow explosions at the surface recording on a much larger number of stations to get more detail at the scale of miles to tens of miles. And those two scales that they're able to image, very large structure, we're able to image shallower but higher detailed structure. That combines to give us some more detailed information about the subsurface that we can then match with the surface geologic mapping and try to understand what the underground geology looks like. Jeff Verbort and Rich Gashnig, both from Washington State University, 
have been looking at two different components. One, geochronology, and the geochronology tells you how old the granitic rocks are, and geochemistry, and the geochemistry basically tells you where the rocks are from. They collected samples throughout the Idaho batholith, but also in adjacent parts of Oregon. They had to go where the rocks were exposed on the surface of the earth. Before Rich started this work, the Idaho batholith was considered to be one more or less continuous uh, intrusion that was formed over a whole long period of time, but, uh, but all related and essentially produced by one, one event. And Rich's work has really shown that there are multiple phases to the batholith, and it actually consists of two main parts that are really separated both in time and in space. And so uh, his work really provided some of the important uh, back background for this project. The final component was my component, which is to look at the structural geology, to look at the folds and the faults and the shear zones in the area to see how the area had been deformed over time. As we started doing this project, we realized we needed a little bit more information, so we added two other parts. The gravity survey also went along the same exact line that John Hole put his seismic experiment on and sampled about every 500 meters or about every five football fields. And so you can tell what the subsurface structure looks like, at least in part, from the gravity analysis. The exhumation study, which is different again, followed where Rich Gashnik had gone, so it went all over the Idaho batholith. And with this, we're looking at when the rocks cooled through certain temperatures in the Earth's crust. And by using those temperatures, we can see what parts came up at what time relative to each other. For any interdisciplinary project, such as the IDOR project, a big problem is trying to get the different data sets to work together and to figure out how each one fits a bit of the puzzle of the tectonic evolution of the area. And so we get together at different times and we present our results to each other and we get to sort of poke and prod and see what really are the hard constraints that each method provides, which are the soft constraints, and how when we can combine the methods, we see more than we get with any individual method. The IDOR project, with its different components, is very much like the blind men and the elephant. Each of the disciplines or each of the techniques we have can see part of the picture, but we can't see the whole. The difference between IDOR and the blind men is that we accept that we're blind men, each with a different methodology, but we start talking to each other while we're doing our work to understand how the whole system works. Mm -hmm.